Okay, so uh, I'll just say that uh, we have a system on Dive uh, that uh, is about to be launched, but uh, at the moment uh, we'll be using Google Earth. And I think that uh, during the pandemic um, and uh, the lockdowns, this was our way to share Israel with literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, thanks to Google Earth and uh, the content providers, the photographers, um, we're actually able to do a lot of what we're going to do. Uh, some of the content is, uh, is mine and some of it is uh, simply what uh, I composed from what is available online and uh, I'm allowed to use it in terms of copyrights. So again, uh, I have to thank uh, these uh, technological companies that enable us to get to the Holy Land. So over here, we are flying above Israel and all the dots and lines that you see, these are the places where we are going to visit. Shiloh, if you look carefully, is located here. Okay, this, uh, sorry, uh, just over here, the right over here. Okay, in the heart of Judea and Samaria, Yehuda Veshomron, as we call it in Hebrew. Uh, it's known in the news as the West Bank. Uh, so this is the heart of Samaria, right over here. This is Shiloh. And my plan is to put the story of Shiloh in the geographical context and in the textual context. Okay, this is the plan. Let's do it. So if I want to explain the beginning of Shiloh, I will have to start in Sinai. So if you look carefully, we kind of dive down okay, from the general view down to Sinai, to Jabal Musa, how it's called in Arabic, uh, the Mount of Moses. And Mount Sinai, Jabal Musa, this is the traditional place of the of Mount Sinai. Yeah. So if we'll go up over there, this is the view. And uh, it's a lovely hike. You can actually do it with Bedouin guides. So just imagine Moses on the mountain for 40 days. He's a very old age, still climbing. And at the bottom of Mount Sinai, and during the exodus of Mount Sinai, the children of Israel were organized in a camp. The picture that you see over here shows us two things. Number one is the tent of meeting right in the middle. The tent of meeting or in Hebrew, the Mishkan. Mishkan meaning dwelling place, the dwelling place of, of not God himself, but his name and uh, his uh, spirit, his abundance. And around him, well organized are the 12 tribes of Israel. In a closer, in, in the close part to the entrance of the Mishkan, we have the tent of Moses and Aaron the priest, just over here, you can see it over here. So this is how the camp of Israel is organized when they are resting during these 40 years of the desert. And when they start walking, Judah, you can see him here on the right corner, Judah is leading the efforts. Judah is the leader. At the end of this camp, we have the tribe of Dan right over here. Okay, Dan and Judah, the head of the tribes and the last of the tribe. Okay, Dan. Okay, so during these 40 years of the Exodus, the children of, the children of Israel are practicing how to be a nation without going through the trouble of economy. <laughs> And without going too much through the trouble of military uh, issues, although they do have wars every now and then, but they are being provided by God. So for that time period, the leader of Israel is from the tribe of Levi, Moses, yeah, Moses and Aaron. They are from the tribe of Levi. And what is special about the tribe of Levi is that this is a spiritual tribe, the teachers of Israel. And um, they are not really suitable for ruling when the children of Israel entering the land. So as long as they are in the spiritual world being provided by God, it's okay. 
to have a leadership from the tribe of Levi. But what happens when the children of Israel enter the land of Israel? The leadership changes from the tribe of Levi to the tribe of Ephraim, okay, from the house of Joseph. The tribe of Ephraim is Joshua. Okay? Joshua will be the next leader. So from Mount Sinai, we're going now to Transjordan, or the Hashemite Kingdom, uh, Jordan itself. And you see, it's pretty quick to go through 40 years in just uh, one second, yeah? So uh, Mount Nebo is eastern from, from Israel. Yeah. It's in the country of Jordan, Mount Nebo. And I want to just land over there. I want you to see the view. So according to the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses dies on Mount Nebo, God buries him. We don't know where his tomb is. And then Joshua replaces him. So this is the view from Mount Nebo. Today there is a church over there and some nice view. You see it over here. So again, thanks to all these photographers, we're actually able to travel all over. So the valley that you see over here this is the jordan valley and the wilderness of jericho with the haze which is almost constant it's always uh, it's foggy and hazy because of all the dirt uh, in the air okay so now the leadership replaces uh, there is a new leadership joshua replaces moses and they will cross the jordan river here we are landing in the jordan river Today, it's the baptismal site of Jesus and John and the crossing point of the children of Israel. This is the place that commemorates these events. Did it happen exactly here or maybe 100 meters to the north or 100 meters to the south? I don't know, but this is approximately the place in the wilderness of Jericho, not too far from Jericho. This is it. It's a beautiful sight today. That's how it looks like when the water are a little higher. And as you can see, it's not the mighty Jordan River any longer. It's actually 5% of the original amount of water. Okay, so it's much smaller than the original river. Okay, what happened to all the water? It's being pumped to the cities in Israel and in Jordan. And that's why it's so small. Okay, so Joshua is crossing the Jordan River. We're talking about the last Passover of the Exodus. Okay, so Passover is the beginning of the Exodus and Passover is the end of the Exodus. The children of Israel will circumcise and celebrate Passover and later they will conquer Jericho. So what you see here, this is today the Palestinian city of Jericho. That's how it looks like. This is the city of Jericho that will be conquered by the tribes. I won't talk much about, you know, there is Rahab and the two spies and she hid them. Later, Joshua and his men will circle um, Jericho seven days, one time every day and seven times on the last day and blow the horns, blow the shofar and the city will, walls will collapse. We also have Mount Temptations over there where Jesus was tried by Satan. So this is another Christian tradition in the city. Okay, from here, the children of Israel will start walk north. They're crossing the Jordan River and they'll start walking north. So I want to show you how they walked. Okay. Uh, what happened? Let me just see. Something kind of jumped. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So from Jericho, this is the Jordan Valley. This is the eastern border of modern Israel today. So we have on the west, we have the Mediterranean. On the east, we have the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And it's only one hour and 20 minutes apart. So you see how small the country is, yeah? Okay, so the, 
The children of Israel are walking north with the Jordan Valley. And at some point, they are turning west. They are turning west in a valley called Tirza. Tirza, T-I-R-Z-A, Tirza. And they are not the first one to walk in the valley of Tirza. This will be also the gateway where Abraham entered the land and where later his grandson Jacob will enter the land through the valley of Tirza. Okay, so as you can see, there is a connection between the patriarchs and later the children of Israel, they enter from the same spot. Okay, so we are climbing now on Mount, uh, on valley, in the valley of Tirza, like this. And soon enough, soon enough, they will reach Nablus Shechem in Hebrew or Nablus in Arabic. Okay, very cool. So now we are entering the land and you can see the city of Nablus. See it? Just over here. So just a general view again. Jordan River, Tirza Valley up and we arrive to Nablus, right over here. Okay. On the northern part of Nablus, we have a mountain called Eval. This mountain is where Joshua's altar was found back in the 1970s. This is a very ancient altar, it dates back to the 12th century BC. And the things that we have found over there indicates that the children of Israel built it. How do we know that? Because of the carbon-14 examination of bones that were sacrificed on the altar, and also because of seals of the pharaoh Ramses II. This is the pharaoh we think it was the pharaoh of the Exodus. So we have solid evidence that this is the place that Joshua built, and this is in accord to the book of Deuteronomy and later the book of Joshua. It's called the mountain of the curse or Mount Eval. So when I talk about the altar, I want to, uh, let me see if I can draw, if I can't. Okay, I cannot draw, but no problem. You can see the people assembling over here and there is a ramp climbing up to the altar itself. And this area was the place where the sacrifice took place. Okay, it looks a little strange now because of the digs and because of some destruction that took place on the mount on the altar, but this is how it looks, the ramp. Oops. Few uh, months ago, few months ago, they have found a plate with ancient Hebrew inscription. And this plate says the following. Curse, curse, curse to God. You shall die. You are cursed. Cursed you shall die. You are cursed to God. This is really scary. But this is in accord to the book of Deuteronomy that tells Joshua and the people of Israel that when they arrive to Israel, they will build an altar and there will be a place where they will curse and where they will bless. So on the north, we have the mountain of the curse. And on the south, we have the mountain of the blessing known as Mount Grizim. So the children of Israel are now at the mountain of the curse, and it's very suitable to find such inscription. Here's a quote from Deuteronomy. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God, that I am giving you today. The curse, if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God, and turn from the way that I command you today, by following other gods which you have not known. The very basic um, contract, I will call it, between God and the children of Israel is to obey the rules of God, and in return, he will give us blessing. It doesn't mean that if we disobey, he deserts us, but we will definitely be punished. And the blessing is always very material. Rain grass, 
okay cattle children okay that's the blessing let's continue from Nablus we are going to go oh you know what let me just see I think there's one yeah it's okay yeah we saw the you see the ramp yeah okay that just shows us the the altar okay so this is the altar let's continue from Nablus the children of Israel will continue south okay so again just so you'll be in the right proportion from Nablus here again Israel Jordan River the Jordan River on the east the Mediterranean on the west and the children of Israel continue south okay still the leadership is from the house of Ephraim okay Joshua when we try to understand the name Shiloh it's really complicated name there are probably 10 different understandings of what it means okay but this is from the book of Genesis the scepter will not depart from Judah meaning he will be the king nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come belongs is Shiloh and the obedience of the nations shall be his okay so this is the English translation but in the word for belongs we have the word Shiloh okay so there is some connection between the place of Shiloh and the rule of Judah okay something will pass on from Shiloh to Judah so the rule of the nations is connected to the name Shiloh and of course connected to the house of Judah in the book of Joshua it says that in Shiloh the children of Israel assembled and they were sent to survey the land write down its borders and its lands and then the land was spread between like divided between the different tribes okay so it's written in the book of Joshua 18 I won't read all of it the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there okay so we have the Mishkan the tent of meeting and the country was brought under their control and now they have to divide it so Joshua said to the Israelites how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land so there is something very repetitive in the behavior of Israel they are a little afraid of being too involved in war okay they are okay we're here with the tent of meetings this is a lot more fun they are very much adjusted to it from the days in the desert okay we are here to be with the in the tent of God they are not really interested in living material life okay farming shepherding okay um, working for their uh, own uh, wealth okay so he's upset with that he says no no you have to take hold of the land and then he says this appoint three men from each tribe and they will survey the land to which a description of it according to the inheritance of each okay so they will divide the land between them so this place this divide division of the tribes will happen over here and uh, from a camp of the 12 tribes now we have the map of the 12 tribes we'll see it very soon another thing that is happening over here as we said is these uh, sorry this is okay we talked about this uh, just the continuation of it let's continue okay how do we know that Shiloh, uh, the site that I'm going to show you, is actually the site of Shiloh? So uh, I explained that the tent of meeting is there, fine. The tribes divided the inheritance, they divided the land over there, fine. But how do we know this is the actual place? So I think between all the archaeological sites, maybe the site of Jerusalem, this is one of the most solid things we have, okay? It's solid that this is Shiloh. So just for starters, we have found Byzantine inscription in Shiloh that says that God have mercy on the people of Shiloh. Okay? So when you find an inscription that is 1,500 years old in a site, this is really helpful. Before we continue with the pictures, okay? 
we have two other things that indicates that. The mountain and a spring, a northern of Shiloh, okay, this area over here, is called in Arabic, Saylun, Saylun, here you see, Saylun, just over here if you are able to see. This is a spring and the valley, eh, sorry, and the mountain here is called Saylun. Saylun in Arabic is just like saying Shiloh. So the Arabs also preserve the name Shiloh. Okay, we have two other reasons. The valley southern of Shiloh, not Wadi Musa, but uh, the, but the valley over here, uh, is known as the Valley of the Girls. The Valley of the Girls, Wadi Al-Banat in Arabic. And um, I will continue and explain later why they call it the Valley of the Girls. It's clearly associated with biblical tradition and we will get to it. So based on the names and based on the geography, which I will point out very soon, we know that this place is ancient Shiloh. North of the archaeological tell or the archaeological hill, we have the new settlement of Shiloh just over here. They have a beautiful synagogue that I want to show you before we continue. That's their synagogue. And if you are familiar with the tabernacle, you will immediately say, wow, this looks like the tabernacle of Moses. So this is the design, looks like a tent. You can see the beams okay it's clearly made of stone and concrete today but in the past in the temple eh, sorry in the tabernacle it was made of wood and when you go inside you'll see the bama the bama is this uh this area where the counter says the prayer looks like an altar you see the corners over here and in front of that the ark also designed like the ark of the covenant with the Torah scrolls and the cherubim, the angels, on top of the ark. So this is the modern Shiloh. Let's continue now and understand better why we are so certain about the location of Shiloh. So this is a nice um, photosphere that was taken by a drone. So here again, the settlement. Uh, of the town of Shiloh, the modern town of Shiloh is over here. And here is ancient Shiloh. You can see a lot of archaeology. More archaeology. It goes up to the hill. This is the top of the hill of Shiloh. And behind it, the area over here, at the north end of Shiloh, this is where the tent of meeting or the tabernacle used to be. Why do we think that? You'll see. Okay, you can see a lot of archaeological stuff over here. Really nice. Let's continue and understand how are we so certain about the place. In the book of Judges, it says, the, the book of Judges, Judges, generally speaking, shows the deterioration of the coalition of the tribes of Israel. So we have the days of Moses in the desert, now very united. Then we have the days of Joshua, they are very united. Then we have a complete collapse during the days of the judges. At this time, and it's very repetitive, the verse goes on and say it over and over again, there is no king to Israel. Each one does whatever he pleases. What do you mean there is no king to Israel? Of course there is a king to Israel. That's God. But the idea is that if there is no one to personify, that person, a leader that brings everyone together, like Moses and Joshua, this abstract idea of one God as the King of Israel, a God that doesn't have any face or image, a God that you're not supposed to say his name, this is really difficult idea, okay? And we actually see it time and time again, the tribes aren't following the word of God, they are handed to their enemies over and over again. Then they remind of they all of a sudden remember God, and God saves them with a judge. 
Towards the end of the book of Judges, we have a, a horrific story, a terrible story about the concubine that was raped and murdered by the people of Benjamin. So you can read it at the last uh, chapters of the, of the book of Judges. But uh, in a nutshell, um, this woman is dead. Her uh, husband is butchering her to 12 pieces, send her pieces to the children of Israel, tribes, and they assemble to war against Benjamin. At the end of that war, there are 400 men left from Benjamin, 400, no women. So now the children of Israel are upset. Okay, we are not a very firm coalition, that's obvious, but we're also about to lose one of the tribes. Okay, we're about to lose one of the sons of Jacob. They cannot allow that. So they say, okay, we need to get these 400 men, women. Hey, but we swore not to give them any women. So we need to come up with a place that didn't send soldiers to the war against Benjamin. This place will be in a, the Gilead. And they take virgin women from Gilead and bring them to the festival of Shiloh. But look, there is the annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh, which lies north of Bethel, east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem, to Naboth, and south of Lebona. Okay. If Shiloh is the center or the capital of the tribes, why do they bother giving such a detailed information about its location? You see? This is the question. It seems like the place was almost forgotten. So the tent of meeting is there. The Ark of the Covenant is there, but the tribes aren't going there. So they need a very detailed description. Take a look. North of Bethel, east of the road, uh, the road that goes to Shechem, and south of Lebona. Okay, let's take a look at the photosphere and see all of that. So Beth, we're looking south right now. So Bethel is in this area. Here's the road, road 60 today is the main road, the main highway of, the, of Judea and Samaria. Here is road 60. So east of the road, okay? This is the continuation of the road up to Nablus. And between Shiloh and Nablus, there is a village called Luban in Arabic. Luban preserved the name Levona. Okay, preserves the Hebrew name Levona. So all these details also helps us to say, yes, Shiloh is really there. This is Shiloh. So now the tribes of Benjamin are instructed, go and hide in the vineyards and watch when the young women of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, rush from the vineyard, and each of you sees one of them to be your wife. Remember the other name I gave to the valley near Shiloh? The valley of the girls, okay? So the valley of the girls in Arabic, Wadil Nat, preserved this tradition, this ancient biblical tradition of girls dancing in the vineyards of Shiloh. It's unbelievable how history and how the names help us understand the Bible. It was preserved from generation to generation, thousands of years, okay? So for all of that, I think I proved that Shiloh is where I say it is, okay? So now I want to explain something about Shiloh itself. The main entrance to Shiloh is from the south. It has deep valleys on the west and on the north and on the east. Also, you can see that Shiloh is not the highest mountain around. So theoretically, you can imagine that if the tribes of Israel would assemble in Shiloh, it's not like all of them are in the city itself. Some of them are watching the tent of meeting from the mountains over here. I'm familiar with another place that has this type of geography. It's called Jerusalem. So Mount Moriah is also a low hill surrounded with Mount of Olives and the Western Hill and other mountains. So this idea that the mountain of God is actually lower of all hills, it applies to this place as well. 
it's not just Jerusalem and Mount Moriah which is low, it's also Shiloh that is low. There are two options of how we understand that. Option number one is God wants us to, hum to, sh to want God wants us to learn humility. Okay, God is not on the highest mountain; is actually on the lowest of hills. And another option is that um, God wants us to connect the land and be lower. Okay, be lower, like lower self to cultivate the land and to bring up children. Okay, so that we can elevate His word up. Okay. So the idea is that, no, you have to connect the land. It's not like Mount Sinai where we saw all the view around. It's the opposite. When you enter the land of Israel, through uh, practicing the word of God on earth, you bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. Okay, this is basically two options of understanding that. So let's continue. Okay. Now you can see that the hill of Shiloh is over here, and we are now at the northern end of Shiloh, where the tabernacle used to be. Itamar, how do you know the tabernacle was here? Okay, so again, you can see just over here, we have this northern valley. How do we know that? So there are two reasons why we uh, think this is the place of the tabernacle. Number one, it's a flat area in more or less the proportions of the tabernacle, which is about 50 meters on 15 meters, okay? So it fits the plaza of the tabernacle. The tent of meeting itself is smaller, but the plaza around it is about 50 meters on 15 meters. On top of that, we have the description of the destruction of Shiloh and how a man is coming from the battle of Ibn Ezer that we will see, and he's running through the city before he gets down to the tabernacle. So if he has to run through the city, he definitely came up from the south all the way here. And as he walks down, everyone around him understands, wow, we lost the battle of Ibn Ezer. And Eli hears the scream, Eli, the, 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 the priest, hears the screams from the city and he's wondering what's happening over here. So this is the two indications why we think this is the place where the tabernacle used to be. So we talked about the tabernacle, okay, this is in the days of the desert. And here's a little model that shows us the tabernacle. We have the entrance to it. We have the altar. We also have tables to slay the, the offerings. And we have the tent of meeting itself where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This is a little model of the Ark of the Covenant. It's from a place over here in Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant uh, with the tablets of Moses, with a piece of manna from the desert, with the Torah scroll that Moses wrote on Mount Sinai, and with the staff of Aaron that has um, almond flowers. All of that is kept in the inner section of the tent. Okay, that's what was inside. In the book of Numbers, we have this covenant. We have this covenant with God, and this is something that Jews recite uh, as a part of the prayer twice a day. I will grant the rain for your land in season, the early rain and the late. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and oil. I will also provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and thus you shall eat your fill. He will shut up the skies, okay, if you're working against him, he will shut up the skies so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its produce, and you'll soon perish from the good land that the Lord is assigning to you. Towards the end now. To the end that you and your children may endure in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to assign to them as long as there is heaven over the earth. So this is a part of what we uh, say twice a day in the prayer. And now we can see how the tribes are organized. We left the desert, we entered the land, now everyone is organized in these valleys 
and mountains. So Shiloh is right in the center within the territory of the tribe of Ephraim. But as we know, God is not pleased with, with Shiloh. And we'll explain that in a moment. He's not pleased with that. And therefore, he will send, um, he will move south. He, will, he wants the Ark of the Covenant to move south to the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel is from the house of ben from the tribe of Benjamin, that's King Saul. And later he says, no, 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 it's not enough. He goes further south to Bethlehem to find another king. Okay, the king, King David, of course. So the point is that you can see that the leadership of Israel is moving from Levi, the tribe of Levi, to the tribe of Ephraim, which is a bit to the north, then to the tribe of Benjamin, a little bit to the south, and ultimately to Judah. It seems like God is doing a fine-tuning, a fine-tuning. Who's the tribe that balances heaven and earth in the most appropriate way? Okay, this is the way I describe it. And let's skip that. Yeah, okay, this is okay. Let's continue. In the days of Shiloh, when uh, the children of Israel pretty much forgot of Shiloh, uh, and we talked about the terrible incident of uh, the concubine uh, that was murdered and almost the annihilation of the tribe of Benjamin, now God uh, brings about a new person to the stage. The name of that person is Elkanah. So if you look, we're like, this is Nablus, this is Shiloh, and now we're heading to a place which is now a Palestinian town called Aram. In the past, in the days of the Bible, there was a village here called Rama, R-A-M-A. -A. And Rama is the village of Elkanah, and later his son, Samuel. So from this place, Elkanah, will go up to Shiloh year after year. And every time he goes to Shiloh, he takes a different road. So instead of going straight to Shiloh, he's turning right, he's meeting people in this village or that village, and he says, there is a celebration in Shiloh, come with me. He's trying to assemble the tribes and remind them that the house of God is in Shiloh, come with me. So every year he does that, and later his son Samuel will do the same. So today there's nothing to see in Ramah, okay? It's not like you are able to visit there. Uh, it's, a, as I said, a Palestinian town. This is the barrier just outside of it, okay? And we're heading now with Elkanah and his two wives, Hana and Pnina, to Shiloh. Hana and Pnina. Hannah and Pnina are arriving this way, entering Shiloh, climbing the main hill, and then they will walk down to the northern end of Shiloh, where the tent of meeting is located. And Hannah is childless. Pnina has children, many children. And Hannah is very, very sad and upset. Oops. So she says the following. She says that if she will have a son, she will dedicate him to God. And when she says that, when she pours her heart, Eli thinks of her as a drunk. It's very humiliating. And she says, and he says to her, remove your wine from you. And she says, I'm not, uh, I'm not drunk. I'm just bitter. My soul is bitter. And he says to her, don't worry. Your, your prayer will be answered. And she will have a son. This son will be Shmuel. Now, this is one of the explanations, the way I see it, of the name Shiloh. Not just belonging, but also Shiloh coming from Sheila. Sheila meaning to ask. Sheila is the actual word, but in the Bible, sometimes they drop some of the words, some of the letters, sorry. So, Sheila. Shela is to ask God, and this woman was asking God to help her to have a child. So when she finally has a child, that's of course young Samuel, okay, she will say the following, which is probably the most beautiful prayer in the entire Bible. 
My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts, boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the God. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. I want to connect that to something that will be written by David in the book of Psalms. Psalms 99 says the following. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. The rabbis were wondering how come King David see Moses and Aaron together as one Samuel? Okay, how come that one prophet Samuel equals Moses and Aaron? Okay, it's like random people, Moses and Aaron. And one of the explanations they have is that Moses and Aaron represents the organized religion or organized faith. And uh, we need the organized faith in order to create community, to build community, to educate the younger generation. But a more important stage of faith is the spontaneous prayer, the faith that comes from us. So we need the organized faith or religion to regulate our life in a way or give us, you know, a structure in which we develop ourselves spiritually. But the higher thing is to be like Hannah, Hannah, to be like Elkanah, to be like Samuel, without a temple, without the organized faith, complete straight direction and connection to God. Okay, so this is one of the options of understanding it. Uh, yeah, okay. So now young Samuel, at the age of two or three, he finished nursing and he will spend his youth in the temple or in the tabernacle, sorry, with Eli and his sons Hophni and Pinchas. Hophni and Pinchas are evil. And Eli doesn't discipline them. And later they will lose their seat in the house of God. They will be murdered by Saul in the town of Nov. So just like God predicted that the house of Eli will be destroyed, so it happened in the days of Saul, Shaul. Okay. Mm, okay, before we continue, let's understand what happened over here. So now we have a battle between the children of Israel and the Philistines. Philistines are coming from the southern part of Israel, a few towns. One of them is Gaza and Ashdod and Ashkelon. Okay? And they have a battle in a place called Ebenezer. Ebenezer. We actually know the place, Ebenezer. This is the area where the battle took place, just in the valley next to it. It's an actual archaeological site, Chirbet Sarta it's called. And this is approximately where the battle took place. And you can see it's the meeting point between the hills and the mountains of Samaria and the coast of the Philistines. See? See the fields? And over here you can see the hills. So the children of Israel, they don't trust God to save them. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. And they cheer and they're happy. And we know how it ended up. The Ark of the Covenant will be taken the, by the Philistines. The children of Israel will fall and a man from the battlefield will run all the way to Shiloh to tell Eli the Kohen, Eli the priest, that there was a defeat and then his children died and then he will say the Ark of the Covenant fell in the hands of uh, the Philistines. And only when he talks about the Ark of the Covenant that was captured, then Eli falls and breaks his neck. It seems like these this priest is more focused on a religious object, let's call it, than the people, than the nation. What is more important than the destiny of the nation? Okay, So it shows us again that the focus on the spiritual with no connection to the ground 
is um, is not the right thing. Okay, you must have this connection to the ground as well. Now the Ark of the Covenant will spend some six months in the fields of the Philistines. So from Chirbet Sarta, it says from Ibn Ezer, it says that um, it will be in Ashdod, in other places. Okay, let's take a look at one of those places. Chirbet Sarta is here, yeah. And the Philistines are a Greek nation, basically. This is from a, an ancient uh, inscription of the uh, of the pharaohs. We know that they were sailors. We know they had ships, and now they captured the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> so after these these six months in the Ark with the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant will be sent by the Philistines away. Why? Because there were so many plagues going on that the Philistines says, "Okay, enough is enough. We are not interested in the Ark." They sent it back in a in a carriage. And it ended up in Bet Shemesh. From Bet Shemesh, it continued to Abu Gosh, Abu Gosh, Kiryat Yarim, it's called. And from there, it will go to um, Jerusalem. Okay, not right away. It will take years, but it will go to Jerusalem. Okay, we have Philistia. I want to show you Gaza and maybe say a word about the Philistines. So today we have a famous Palestinian city called Gaza, okay, it's in the southern coast of Israel. And I will just point out that the Palestinians today derive from the same name, but they're definitely not the same people. As I said, the Philistines were Greek in origin, and the Palestinians are mainly Arabs in their origin, okay. In the days of Caesar Adrian in the second century, he wanted to punish the Jews for their revolt and he stopped naming the province of Judea the province of Judea. Instead of that, he took the name of the ancient enemies of Israel, the Philistines, and he named the entire province, instead of the province of Judea, the province of Palestina. Okay, so 1800 years ago, this is the man that started uh, the name, naming the country Palestine. Historically, Philistia is a small area in the coast of Israel. It's not the entire country. Okay? Philistia is the southern coast of Israel. So this is Gaza port, just over here. And let's continue. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says the following. The Lord saw this and rejected them. Because he was angered by his sons and daughters, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be. God is upset. He doesn't break the covenant with Israel, but he's upset with them, so he hides his face from them. For they, will, for they are a, preserved gener a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. They made me jealous by what is no God, and angered me with their worthless idols. I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. Modern rabbis today will say this is our punishment. Palestinians, which is a creation of the 20th century, especially by the Arab League, this is our punishment of our generation. Okay. So all these prophets, uh, all these prophecies from the Bible are happening right now. Shiloh will fall. As we said, Shiloh will fall uh, after the battle of Ibn Ezer. And in Shiloh itself, in the western side of the hill, we have found remains of the destruction that happened approximately in the 11th century. And in this room, we found layers and layers of ashes from the fire that consumed Shiloh. And we can date it back because they found lots of jugs like that with wheat and uh, with remains of uh, a organic food, basically. So we actually can indicate uh, the time 
on, on which it happened. So after the battle of, of Ibn Ezer, Shiloh will fall. And this is taking place um, 50, 40, 50 years before the rise of King David. Okay? So during these 50 years, we have the prophet Samuel that tries to assemble the tribes after the catastrophe of the battle of Ibn Ezer. Um, in the picture over here, you can see a man that is dressed up like the high priest. This is not Sa Samuel, okay? But what you can see is that he's wearing some kind of a coat, okay? Uh, this is the Hoshen, the Hoshen that were the 12 stones that represents the 12 tribes uh, was. But the, but the garment itself is called Ephod, Ephod. And we know, because the Bible tells us, that Prophet Samuel was wearing the ephod. And it seems like every prophet was spiritual enough to wear this type of garments, like an indication this is the uniform of the prophets. They had some sort of a coat that looks kind of like that. Okay, so this is the ephod. Now we're moving to the place, and we're about to finish, yeah, uh, to the place where Prophet Samuel was uh, a teaching the children of Israel, judging the children of Israel. This place is called the tomb of Prophet Samuel. The biblical name for this hill is Mitzpah. Mitzpah. It's not too far from Jerusalem. So you can actually see the buildings of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives in the distance. This is the neighborhood in Jerusalem, all that. So in this place, Mitzpah, it says that Prophet Samuel will judge the people of Israel. Is he buried there? No. He's buried in Ramah, okay? The Palestinian town that I mentioned. But is this the place where he judged Israel? Yes. Okay? So today there is a mosque that was built on top of a church, and inside that mosque there is a synagogue. It's a very confusing little place and very beautiful place. I highly recommend you'll visit it. So just so you'll have the proportion, okay? We talked about the children of Israel entering through the valley of Tirzah to Nablus. Then, for a few centuries, the tent of meeting will be in Shiloh. And then, the gravity, the center of gravity, will move towards Jerusalem. Not right away, it will be a process, but it will move towards Jerusalem. So right now, we're in the tomb of Prophet Samuel. That's how the place looks like from, you know, just from the ground. So this is the traditional tomb of Prophet Samuel. As I'm about to conclude the visit, uh, no, I'll skip this one. I'll just say that when uh, King Shaul was ruling, it was also not too far from Jerusalem in a place called Givat Shaul, the hill of Shaul. And he will be replaced by King David since he did not slay the Amalekites. So in the picture over here by Gustav Duro, you can see Prophet, Prophet, Sham, uh, Prophet Samuel. Next to him, this is, uh, this is uh, King Saul, King Shaul, and this is Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And uh, because he spared his life and Samuel had to kill him, uh, Saul was punished that his reign will end. So King David will replace him a, a, years, a few years later. Now, as we are about to conclude, I'll just point out, King David was born in Bethlehem. You can see constantly how God passes the leadership to the south, yeah? So King David is from Bethlehem, and ultimately he will move the capital to Jerusalem and will bring the Ark of the Covenant to Mount Moriah, where the Golden Dome is. So let's read uh, these few verses over here, not this one. Okay, this is Psalm 78. He abandoned, God of course, yeah? He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among humans. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, the battle of Ibn Ezer, his splendor into the hands of the enemy, the Philistines. He gave his people over to the sword. He was furious with his inheritance. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. Again, we talked about Ephraim, Joshua. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he, cho but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. 
So now we see how the journey of the Ark of the Covenant ends from the days of the Exodus to Shiloh, to the captivity of the Philistines, Kiryat Yarim and a few other places, all the way to Jerusalem when David wanted to build a, a temple, basically. Um, he basically said, um, he sees, yeah, I dwell in a house of cedar. God, eh, sorry, David is dwelling in a house of cedar, a very beautiful palace. But the ark of God dwelt within curtains, okay, in a tent. So he's not happy with it. And God will promise him, don't worry, I will have a temple, but you will not build it. Your son Solomon will build, will build it. So I think uh, we understood now the place of Shiloh, uh, both geographically speaking and both on the context of the Bible, how God passes his leadership to the south as there is some fine tuning. He's looking for the right leadership to balance between heaven and earth, to balance between the material and the spiritual. With that, I conclude. And uh, if there are any questions, you're most welcome. And uh, I'll try to walk over here. Yeah, this is the top of the hill where this uh, building is. There is a little museum and a theater over there. And now we can walk to the place of the tabernacle. One second. Okay, better. This is the approximate location of the tabernacle, this plaza that you see over here. As you can see, some parts were chiseled over here in the rock. Make sure there's enough room for the plaza of the tabernacle. We have some remains of foundations, but uh, not necessarily of the days of the tabernacle. So this is it. Yeah. I want to show you the, um, one second, the Byzantine church. So this is a Byzantine church. I just showed you the inscription. Uh, earlier that tells us this is uh, Shiloh. There is a little museum in a, a building that was built in the 1930s over here. This is not the original basilica, yeah? So there is a nice uh, exhibition over there. And on the entrance to that Byzantine church, we have a beautiful mosaic, including a Star of David. So this is one of these indications that tells us that stars of David are not really uh, a Jewish symbol. It was only it only became a Jewish symbol in uh, the last few centuries. Uh, historically, the menorah, the menorah, the candelabra, the menorah with the seven candles. This is the uh, ancient symbol of Israel. Really beautiful, really. Have a look, it's the mosaics. Very well preserved. There are a few mosaics over here in the aisles. And where the apse. Just over here too. Yeah, these are all finds that were discovered uh, in Shiloh. So we have a constant presence um, since biblical times uh, all the way to Arab conquest, uh, crusades, they were here. I want to I want to mention real quick also, Itamar, that the um, the stone that was found the altar in Shiloh, they've actually moved it inside of this church. Uh, it's to it's when you go in the entrance, uh, it's to the right, and right now on your left, they actually have the uh, the altar itself. Um, this one. Yeah, exactly. The part of the altar. Ape. Exactly. Yeah, you can see the, uh, the 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 cornerstone there, the little horn on the on the corner oh, of the altar there as well. Nice. Uh, well, the the altar doesn't suppose to have any chiseled, you know, parts, but uh, maybe. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yes, my friends. Oh, I see some action in the chat. Welcome, Emily and Margaret. I hope it was not too fast for you and um, I hope you retained uh, much from it. Um, it was my pleasure to be with you and uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes. Paul, if you have any questions, you're most welcome. Thank you, Itamar, and <clears throat> thank you, Abe. As Abe mentioned uh, before the meeting started, <clears throat> his, his company has just acquired a brand new camera and they will be re-photographing many of the sites in Israel in the near future and uh, the Bible students have always been his uh, his guinea pigs for uh, for his presentations <laughs> and uh, so we're looking forward to the new imaging that will be coming um, we have a question from Robin Rice that did Samuel inhabit and sleep in the original tabernacle tent, or was there a modified structure in which the tabernacle furniture was set up? Um, so I, I'm just trying to look for the uh, for the right verse. I, if I remember correctly, he was sleeping just outside the tent. First Samuel three verses two and three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 